keep okay. us on on point. So yep. Okay. So I've got so I've got it recorded. All right. We are recording. Great. All right. Well, with that, good evening, everyone. I will start the regular meeting of the Board of Finance for Monday, August seventeenth, twenty twenty. Order. Uh, first item on the agenda is public forum. I don't believe I see anybody in public forum on the call. So we'll move on to agenda item number two, approved minutes of the regular meeting of July 20th, 2020. For your motion. So moved. Second. Comments, questions, um, or edits or revisions? I have no, a question. Go ahead, go ahead, Ken. I had a couple, but go ahead. Okay. Uh, at the end of uh, standing building committee minutes, uh, I asked about the, I know we don't have tonight, so maybe this is absorbed in what's going on with the standing building people, but uh, the school facilities needs assessment, maybe the person who addressed this to is Linda, do we have a report on that, that coming down yet? Um, there is a report it is being reviewed um, by the standing building committee right now so they're making some changes and there will be a finalized report coming soon at which point there will be a meeting of the board of ed board of selectmen board of finance to go over the findings of the report possibly next month i don't know a date i don't want to commit specifically to next month but soon Okay. Uh, as far as corrections, just very minor. Uh, let me just make sure I get the pages right. And I can't find the pages actually. All right, let's try this. Under um, hmm, agenda item five, town government expenditures. Um, Unfortunately, there's not page numbers. So the very bottom of um, the page that has the sentences, Mr. Gammerman asked if that would be there would be more revenues or expenditures for youth and family services. Page um, five. Is that page five? You can see it. If you look up at your board, board app, app. Yeah. yeah, I'm not. It counts seeing, it as it goes. I'm not, I, I'm not seeing that either as I'm going through it. Hold on, maybe if I do it this way. It's up in the title region, not in, it's just to the right of the four boxes in your board pack. It's up on the menu. It's not on the pages. <laughs> well, believe it or not, I don't have any. Okay. <laughs> then we can't help you anymore. <laughs> no, you, you, gave, you gave me what that, that, that page was. That's five, right? Page five, five anyway. And I can go to page seven and at the top is page seven uh, in the paragraph uh, or the sentence that starts with that surplus that they have to remove the word comes. And then seven, eight, nine, there's two areas, uh, two, two locations where site improvements should be S-I-T-E. Uh, middle of the page and a little bit below that. That's all I have. Anybody else? No. Okay. Um, Your acceptance? Hold on one second. Um, please hold. Please hold. I have two people joining. One is Chief Hershaft and the other is, I believe, Jonathan Trotta. All right. Jonathan, you are there. All right. Hello. Hello. Good evening, Chief. Good evening. Okay, so, um, Jonathan, just so you know, we just started the meeting. Um, we, were okay. just, we were about to approve the minutes, uh, the regular meeting minutes. Uh, there's, right. a, there's a motion and a second. Did you have anything for the meeting? Any corrections or anything? Uh, the minutes? Oh, the minutes are okay. Okay. Then I'm going to call a vote. All in favor? Aye. Aye. 
Aye. Any opposed? Aye. Any abstentions? I don't believe so. Everyone was here, I believe. Okay. Next item on the agenda is uh, item three, correspondence. Um, as you may have noticed, there's no standing building committee. Uh, that is because their meeting, which was usually the first Tuesday, you may recall there was a bit of a tropical storm that came through. Um, <laughs> they, they, had, they had their meeting on uh, August 11th, so the meeting minutes were not ready. So that is why we did not receive them this month. We will get them next month. Um, pension committee minutes. Anything on pension committee? I had just a general question in looking at the investment report. Um, I saw where we started the year and where we ended the year. And I, I guess I'm, I'm directing this at Bob and his former incarnation. Uh, did we do well? Uh, how, if you evaluate that, was our performance over the year equal or comparable to that of other municipalities? Or, uh, in other words, were you pleased with it? Well, my, my observation, Ken, is that the, this is pretty much doing what it's meant to do. In a down market, it, it suffered less than a usual portfolio would. And the recovery is, is on the way. But of course, it's less volatile. It's, it's coming back a little more slowly. Uh, interestingly enough, you know, fixed income, you know, the capital gains on fixed income, or at least non-taken, you know, bonds came back price-wise, because as you know, all the interest rates fell that much. Um, mm -hmm. Surprisingly, the big winner was international growth, simply because it had fallen off a cliff you know, prior to that. The big winners actually were emerging markets and international growth. So the cheapest things, the things that you buy because you hang on to because they're cheap, actually finally did something. But it doesn't mean that you know, um, they, they're, they're shooting the lights out. The two things that you know they wanted to discuss were you know are value still worth it because value has been cheap for years and at this point looks like value shares may may be cheap forever you know they're just not underperforming uh, the real estate stuff it's only three 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 point three percent of the portfolio REITs unfortunately I didn't attend the meeting they had presentations from two REIT managers real estate investment trust managers I didn't hear what they had to say um, you know they've been underperforming for a very long time, although they did recover a bit in that month. It was just a dead cat bounce. So I'm, I'm um, curious to see what they'll say. Wednesday, what is it? Wednesday this week they meet? Thursday? They meet again after, after we do. Yeah. Uh, it would be nice, actually, if they met a couple of days before we did. But we might not get the minutes in time. But, um, so this is month-old information. Um, it's not meant to shoot the lights out. It's 55% or so equities. A traditional pension fund is not that heavy in equities but bonds aren't doing it for anybody right now. So, um, uh, you know, from inception, it's, it's outperformed just about any other municipal bond fund in, the, in Connecticut. It's up, I think, about 2.9% so far this year, um, even though the market's hit new highs. So you, you can ask yourself, is that appropriate? I think we're just lagging the market. Have they, uh, have they picked a new manager? FIA they picked last year um, when I was still there, and they're doing a great job. They're much more proactive and much more informative. I must say also, that as far as I know, as far as I'm concerned, this is the most qualified pension committee we've ever had. Um, the, the backgrounds, uh, the experience that they have is top drawer. So mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not, not concerned about the management. So, Mr. Hartman, I'd like to ask you: Do you do you think there's a little momentum to possibly limit our exposure to REITs? Yeah, the, the the underlying question, Jonathan, is whether or not what's in the REITs are they composed of office buildings in New York City, uh, shopping malls in the Midwest, or are they big warehouses full of Bitcoin manufacturing? You know. So, you know, real, real yeah, estate investors. I've seen some that specialize too in medical buildings. They, they, that's right. They can do, they could. So, I, and I didn't attend the meeting, so I don't know what was said. So we'll find out. Anyway, the bottom line is, you know, we'll, we'll probably, they'll probably want to stay in REITs for diversification, but they may alter the underlying assets. 
just out of curiosity, last month um, there was uh, comments, uh, you know, that we recovered and, and you know we we were doing well and we were doing you know we were doing better, but there, we still weren't at the uh, target number of six point was it six point five. Six and a half, yeah. Six and a half. So, Mary Jane, or what? I, I didn't do the math. Where are, where do we stand right now in terms of? Do you know by chance what the return is right now? Uh, I, I I don't I don't know what that is off the top of my head. I, I just yeah. happen to see it as two point nine. On the other hand, last yeah. year it was up fourteen point seven. Okay. So I, now, I, just, I was just curious where we were in, in uh, relation to the target. Um, yeah. I hadn't looked at it. Yeah, it's got some catching up to do. Okay. Yeah, I mean. It's, a hard year to compare to any to anything else. Um, they will be uh, having more conversations regarding REITs on on Wednesday morning. So okay. we'll see where that goes. Great, but the, I mean, just to go back to double back to Mr. Gamerman, it's a slow moving portfolio, Ken. It's not. It's you know we reach we're re reaching new highs because of Amazon and and um, Tesla and the like. That's not this kind of portfolio. Right. Okay. Uh, anything else on pension? If not, item number four, review and approve expenditures for town government. Uh, we will start with fiscal year 2019-2020. And uh, I believe, as usual, we will start with revenues. Uh, good evening. Um, so tonight we are um, presenting where we currently stand with the June 30, uh, 2020 figures. Uh, keep in mind that as we work our way through the audit, we will be continuing to make some uh, adjustments uh, here and there. We do have, um, when we get to expenditures, we do have one adjustment that I know that we've yet to do. Um, but anyway, as you can see from the revenues, um, not too different than what we presented last month, but we have a surplus of $1.2 million uh, made up primarily in tax collection. Um, the ambulance did very well, and uh, the uh, State Board of Education, uh, mainly uh, because of the way we budgeted and the excess costs that stayed in the town's coffers. So um, I don't know if anybody has any specific questions regarding last year's revenues? Uh, I don't believe I did. Um, everything was, you know, I did have some questions, but then as I looked into the backup, uh, they were pretty well answered. So I think I have a pretty general question that maybe I'll repeat a little bit tonight. So I, th I think we've done a fantastic job budgeting in, in the time I've been on the board and, and, and watching our finance director in action. But I'm kind of wondering now, last couple of years running these surpluses, maybe are we starting to lean a little too conservative in our in our budgeting? So just maybe throw that out there as an idea. I think just in the general statement on that, uh, I believe this past uh, budget season going into next year, we were less conservative. And then on top of it, we are all eagerly awaiting our crystal ball to see what's going to be the cost of this pandemic, which um, the more and more I hear about what the state may be contributing, what the feds may, may not be contributing, and what the Board of Ed is gonna need, um, I think actually the conservatism might pay off in this. I know you like to say, let's give it back to the taxpayers. I think we're about to give it back to them in droves, but um, that's, that's my personal feeling right now uh, based on what we're seeing. Um, I think it's good that we are where we are. Um, there's a lot of towns that are in a lot worse shape and the AAA bond rating pretty much proves that. Um, so I, I think we're gonna see over the next few months and we're gonna have this discussion with the Board of Ed tonight under old business about where things are going. And uh, Linda, you know, I'm, I, I know you're on with us and you give us updates every month. Um, but I, I, <clears throat> again, when I had briefly spoken with Katie, actually it was just by email today, uh, inviting her to be part of our meeting tonight. Um, she was saying a lot of things that I figured we were gonna be asking questions of tonight. So I said, why don't you just join us after your meeting? Because um, their concerns are just like ours right now, is that they're seeing costs start to climb. Um, they're projecting it to climb, and yet there's no idea how much it's gonna climb. And 
Uh, if I were a betting man, I hate to say this, but I don't think we're going to be in school very long. We do have an unusual year ahead of us. It, it but, is uh, going to be back, crazy. So buckle up. Last couple of years. Yeah, no, and, and we've done, we have, you're, Jonathan, you're right. We have been, I think in some cases, we have been conservative. This past budget season, we were much less conservative in what we did. Um, we did take out of unassigned. Um, we did, uh, I think, narrow down the numbers um, more than what we were seeing this past year uh, in a few different categories. How that's going to relate into going into 21, 22, the, the following year is going to be very interesting. But I think we're going to be, we're going to be tracking that very closely to see how we can um, best use that unassigned fund balance, if at all. Um, but I'm pretty, pretty sure we're going to be using it. So I, I do. Of course, at the time we did that, we expected you know a lot less of a surplus than we're looking at right now. Mm -hmm. I mean, if, yeah, if no, that's true. From, uh, our director, but I think you know we got two point five million dollar surplus. So you know, wow. <laughs> Um, well, I mean, yeah, the projection was half a million, and now we're at uh, you know the 1.5. Let's just, let's just round it. You know, we were at half a million, and we're at 1.5 right now. That million dollars, I think, is going to be put right back, <laughs> right back into an expenditure to cover these. Uh, I, and, and you know, I don't even know. I haven't. I'll be honest. I haven't really talked to Matt. I know Matt's very busy, and Mary Jane. I'm sure you'll be able to answer this, but you know what the impact uh, currently is with the town. And I don't want to jump too far ahead. I think expenditures, we can cover that as opposed to revenues, but you know, what's uh, the current impact? And I think we're seeing that in the line items that you're, mm -hmm. you're creating um, where those expenses, we're going to try to get some uh, FEMA or CARES Act money. Well, there's even more good news and expenses, right? Well, there is. Yeah. So, um, Anything else on revenues that we want to address? I, I, I was, I mean, it was very positive to see where we are. And, um, and I think a lot of that, as, as I was looking at the numbers, you know, Board of Ed and, and tax collection, those are the two where those, those are the, that's where two thirds of that, that extra, that 1.2 is coming from, if not more. I, I do think it's important to note that the surpluses, um, you know, one, you know, one, one point two million dollars is a lot of money. Don't get me wrong, but on a on a million dollar budget, that's a pretty small percentage variance from from what we had targeted. So I think it's it's not as though we missed the mark by ten percent on the revenue side or, or similarly on the expense side. So. Did you did you say I mean a hundred million dollar budget? I think that's what it sounded like you said a million. I just want to make sure. Right, a hundred million dollar. Hundred million. Budget. Okay, I want to make sure. Yeah. Said a million, I meant a hundred million dollar budget. <laughs> the surplus is a million one point two. Just want to make sure. Yep. Yep. Exactly. You're right, Jeff. That's that's just the town side, though, right? The million two. The million two is just the town side, yeah. Okay. Right, but all, all the revenue is on the town side. Right, good point. Okay, uh, if nothing else on revenue, we can shoot over to expenditures. Okay, uh, since we last met, we've done a lot of work on the expenditure side. Um, hopefully you received an email and on the board pack, there is an updated um, expenditure uh, uh, summary uh, for you. Um, so uh, since last meeting, we have closed a number of purchase orders that were deemed um, un unnecessary for the end of the year. And uh, we've also opened some uh, to cover projects that were unable to get done during COVID that we still anticipate needing to get done. So it represents the $722,000 in, um, in encumbrances. Uh, you might see in the detail, uh, if you were to look at that, that um, the line items for COVID all read zero. We have uh, reversed those and made them in a receivable um, for June 30. It's more of an accounting function than, than anything else. Um, so all of those are deemed receivables um, so that the uh, 
June 30 reports can, can accurately reflect that. Um, we, we do have um, at, at the moment a number of FEMA applications working at the same time now thanks to the storm. Um, so we've turned our attention from COVID to the storm um, and because uh, we have reports that are due to FEMA on Wednesday. Uh, that summarizes everything we did for the storm when we don't even quite know what we did for the storm yet, but the reports are due Wednesday. Uh, so that's what we've been focusing our efforts on. Um, and then we will be going back to COVID and uh, requesting those funds. Um, you can see on the expenditure report, there are four line items that are overdrawn and we will be addressing those during the transfers later on um, in the agenda. Um, I did ask uh, Chief Hershaf to attend tonight's meeting uh, in case there were additional questions um, related to uh, his budget. So he is here to um, assist with those answers if needed. Great. Thank you. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Anything else on expenses the questions i had were really addressed or will be addressed in the transfer so one one quick one from me mary jane okay i was hope i was just curious or wondering to see if we were going to get any relief in this fiscal year on the on the uh, interest payments a you reduction mean, on the interest yeah. payments yeah for you mean for debt yep uh, well, the relief we'll see um, in the 2021 year in the new budget. Oh, I thought we were going to get 73,000 this year or something. No, that, that's that was the amount we reduced next year's budget for. Okay. Because the the interest um, payments um, we we've already made those payments, so okay. um, mm -hmm. it's in the in the new budget. Great. Okay. Um, special fund warrants. Any on special fund? No. I had one thing. Yep. Can. Yep. can go ahead. I had a question on that too. Which I'm sorry, which one I missed it? Special, special funds. Special fund war. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. No, go ahead. If you specific question, go ahead. So I, one of them just caught my attention. It was for True Blue Environmental for the water main feasibility study. And uh, it was a pretty, pretty big check for about 80 grand. But that, that's all part of the water project, right? And that is a wash with all the revenue, right? Correct, yes. Okay. I just, True Blue I just is our contractor. Mm -hmm. Caught my attention as a, as a pretty big payment. Mm -hmm. And they've been bigger, but this, it <laughs> looks actually like it's starting to um, wind down. Correct. That project is is winding down. Um, Application and, uh, yep. So there's been quite a few. Mm -hmm. uh, um, any idea? How, um, it's probably maybe in the capital fund reports, but how much uh, is left? Or what percentage? In, in the in, in that uh, that's left to, that's left in the contract in terms of amount that we could expect. Uh, I had a report that I purposely had with me for my meeting here. I must have left it on my on my desk. There's um, there's at least two million dollars left um, in the in the total project. Okay, so there's still quite a bit, quite a bit left. Yes. Okay. Okay. But there are a number of families online now getting water. Through the water main. Yes, most of the families will be on online, and we will still have work to to finish. And just so you know, we have not yet tapped into the loan. Um, I, I anticipate doing that uh, this quarter. Uh, we tried to hold off using the loan as long as possible so that we can minimize the amount of interest that the property owners needed to uh, pay. And we wanted to make sure that we received all of our other grants first. So um, we'll we will be tapping into that probably this quarter. Okay. 
Anything on any of the warrants? Weekly, regular warrants, special fund now. I do not have anything. Uh, just one more question on another special one. It's for the Marina Commission dredging. And I was on that com commission ages ago, and I'm just curious, do, are they still taking in enough revenue so they're actually covering all the dredging? Okay. Uh, yes, they are, and we've been um, trying to set the money aside specifically for that uh, to ensure that the money is there. Okay, it's great how that works, right? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> One thing caught my eye just because it's the kind of thing that does uh, 20 webcams. Uh, we purchased webcam. The many of our employees uh, who need to do Zoom meetings have monitors and desktops that don't have um, camera access. Um, so we ordered webcams and we're hoping to get reimbursed um, through the CARES Act for those. Um, but uh, it's allowing our employees to have video access for this type of meeting. They're hard to get a hold of. Yeah. Well, we'll make you a deal. <laughs> <laughs> I sit as far away as I can from mine. <laughs> okay. Um, if nothing else on warrants, we have two updated capital fund reports. Um, yep, so th those are the capital reports that, again, um, may have some adjustments uh, at June 30. Um, but as we discussed, there are a number of school projects which we will be closing out. They're the ones, um, fund 216, they're the items that are highlighted in red. We'll be closing right. them out. It just, it just it hasn't come up on the top of the radar screen yet um, to do so, but we'll be taking care of that. Yep, that's good. That's, so that's four, four of them will be uh, closed out. Yes. Okay. Um, and then on the town side, town multi-year projects, that's fund 217. Um, again, yeah, I looked at those. Are there any of those that are looking to get closed out? There, some, of, some of them are, are very close. I, I thought I would concentrate on the school ones that we're sure of this year yep. and maybe concentrate more on the town side next year. Okay. Yeah, it looks a couple of them look like there's not much left they're, in there. Right, they're, getting, they're, they're very close. They're right. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. I just didn't know if there was any color coding to those either, but it looks like there's no, they're, color. they're just there's those, a different color for each. There's just a different color for each one. <laughs> right. No problem. All right. Any any questions or um, comments on the capital projects reports? I know the next item here is the expenditures that were revised that I just loaded. So that's, we already went over that. Um, medical, we usually don't get one in the first month. No, it, we don't. Um, and, and usually the month of July, uh, Anthem is usually a little bit behind and, and we are. So um, we'll, ha we'll have up-to-date numbers for the next meeting. Okay. All right, great. Okay, so that is the rundown for fiscal year 1920. Uh, so I'll do a little recap here before we move on to the next item for 2021. Um, as uh, was already stated, and I can't remember exactly where it was, I think it was in um, expenses someplace. I don't remember where I read it, but this is where I got it from. We preliminary approved preliminarily approved uh, 2,352,486 last month. Uh, so the additional expenditures uh, that were just brought to our attention will bring the uh, June total to $2,668,046. So all we need to do is approve the difference. Correct. Um, so I'm gonna entertain a motion to approve the additional June expenditures of the town in the amount of 315,000 $560. So moved. Second. Any further comments? 
All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions or recusals? Okay. We'll move on to 4.2. That is the 2021. Uh, we're only approving the warrants uh, for this fiscal year. Um, any questions on the expense summary or any of the warrants? A question on the special fund. Um, Go ahead. The housing feasibility. What is that fund now? Mutual housing. I'm just trying to get it up here. That's the, I believe that's the study the affordable over, housing study. Correct. Over by the, uh, that's the Woodruff, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Woodruff property. Got it. Where are we on that feasibility study? I think they, NeighborWorks New Horizons is the one, the contract, right? Right. Mm -hmm. So now they have to secure the funding. They have to go for like state grants and any other funding. Okay. Before but they can start any of their construction work. They need the, what was that Mary Jane? As Megan was saying, they need to um, receive, get all their funding in line um, just before, they, before start, they can start their construction. But they're in the process right now, probably the design process and trying to secure the permits and everything. So it'll be a little while right. before we see construction because it's in design. Right, it'll be and a little bit. They're mm -hmm. after the budget, they're after $5 million in grants. Good, good, let's make it happen. It's awesome. Um, okay, anything else under warrants? Hold on one second, I'm gonna need it. Okay, I'm back. <laughs> whenever the whenever the ambulances or fire engines go, it's a screeching. I don't I don't I don't want to torture you all. So, um, all right. If nothing else, and all we need to do is um, I'm going to entertain a motion to approve the report of expenditures of the town for the month of July 2020 in the amount of four million six hundred forty one thousand five hundred sixty four dollars. So moved. Second. Second. Further discussion? Probably not. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed abstentions or recusals? Okay. Um, staying on the town, um, I do have some text here I'll read eventually, but um, Mary Jane, if you want to um, do a recap of the summary sheet that you provided to us. Uh, yes, so as I mentioned, when we discussed the expenditures, we did have four line items uh, that were uh, overdrawn at the end of the year. Mostly items that we have, mostly items we've discussed. Um, building department, um, as discussed, is over by the contracted salaries um, offset by revenue on the other side. And if you'll hopefully recall that in the new year, we have budgeted um, this line item more appropriately so that we won't have this um, moving forward. Um, so this should be the last year. Uh, the next line item is economic development. Um, that position is an, an hourly position and um, went slightly over uh, what we had budgeted, uh, less than $500. Uh, the fire department um, is over by $208,000 uh, due mainly to replacement costs um, for uh, members who are on long, long-term long disability. And again, the chief is here if you wanted more um, detail on that. Um, and the fourth item is capital. Um, we had a, a number, the whole list of items that I have there um, are either items that uh, we are slightly overdrawn um, for their, for items that were budgeted or they are items that we during the budget season, uh, we chose to do out of surpluses that we knew we were going to have this year, and the decision was made through the Board of Selectmen to um, get them done uh, this year instead of moving in, into next year's um, budget. So 
Um, those are the, the four items I have for 476,486 um, to come from the police department, employee benefits and park and recreation. Um, two questions real quick, one on capital. Yep. Um, a dollar amount percentage, just again, what's the proportion regarding what was added um, to this year versus what was um, planned upon but went over? Do you know? I would say the majority of it is uh, new items. New items as opposed to went over. Yes. Okay. Um, my other quick question is, you know, the chief's on, so uh, I want to be able to, you know, ask him a question while he's on. Um, on the replacement costs, on the long-term disability, is that something that is just a, a unique factor for this particular year that it went over? I don't remember seeing long-term disability replacement costs of that kind of number before. Is that just, uh, is that a anomaly? Last year we had a similar experience, but this year, uh, 68,000 of that is directly related to COVID-19. Okay. Uh, we had an at-risk uh, employee who elected not to work, so we're entitled to completely uh, replace him. And hopefully we'll receive FEMA funding for that. And on top of that, we had another 16,000, almost $17,000 for administrative functions directly related to COVID-19 again will be directly uh, should be uh, covered under FEMA. Okay. FEMA or the CARES Act? FEMA. Under FEMA. So those are numbers that we're looking also to possibly get reimbursement on? That's correct. That's correct. We should be a, get a fairly large percentage of that back. We're, okay. we're still fine-tuning those numbers but you know, roughly when we took first look at the when Mary Jane brought it forward to us, we took and found out why, and it's about $85,386 worth of whys in, in the replacement salaries okay. for COVID-19. The rest of it is long-term uh, uh, illnesses. We've had uh, two that were almost a year, and then four other ones that would, were uh, – six months, three months, two months, but all replaceable. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Chief. You're welcome. Chief, do you expect that? that oh, go ahead. I'm okay. sorry, do you expect that to continue going forward into this year or, or is that uh, uh, last year? We, uh, one retired, the other ones are back to work. Um, but however, we have one right now that's out. Um, and it's probably gonna be out to at least October. Yeah. So uh, above and beyond this, Chief, of course, I looked at this and I wondered what was it that you, you've answered half of it, the difference between overtime and replacement salaries. But overtime was big, too. Is that also COVID related? Yes, some of it is. Okay. Any other questions regarding the operating budget transfers? And we'll have two separate motions uh, shortly. Um, I just figured, Mary Jane, if you want to review the fund balance budget transfers also. Okay, um, we have some recommended um, fund balance budget transfers. And I, I just like to know, I should have said at the beginning that the Board of Selectmen um, unanimously approved all of this this morning um, before it came to you, which is okay. our, our practice. Right. Um, so we have two line items in employee benefits, um, reserve for personnel and retirement sick leave that we budget based on an estimate of what we might need for the year. We do have an assigned fund balance um, and committed fund balance uh, for those particular types of items. So um, we're recommending that the balance left in those two line items be moved to um, the fund balance reserve for personnel and um, fund balance committed for uh, retirement sick leave. Um, on the library side, um, there's a significant amount of salary left over um, due to a couple things. We had a, a, a lot of shifting in the library and changes to employees, which had a significant savings to the town. Um, and then on top of that, we had a number 
of um, changes during COVID. So um, it's the two together uh, has given mm -hmm. us a $50,000 surplus um, in the library salary lines. And we are recommending that that too be placed um, into the reserve for personnel um, to help offset future budgets um, as, as we go, go forward. As was alluded to earlier, we are anticipating our 21 budget, 21, 22 budget to be um, much more difficult than even the, uh, the, the 2021 that we're in. So we're hoping that that will help offset some of our salaries as we move forward because we, we have more negotiations to go through. And the last one, um, if you remember last month, I reported that we had savings in town properties for the purchase of the streetlights and the hydrants um, due to the merger with Connecticut Water. Uh, and that totaled $117,000. So um, we're recommending that that go into, again, the committed fund balance um, for future facility projects. Uh, so um, that's what we have uh, for your discussion this evening. Okay. Questions on fund balance transfers? Hey, how about if we just return it to the taxpayers instead? Is that a question for all of them? Sure. <clears throat> well, if we were, I, I mean, if we were not to do this with the extra, we got the 298.8, we're going to be looking for it again later on, right, on these fund balances. Eventually, so, yes. So what we would have to budget for, the, we would have to budget for these items in the future. So in, this in, would alleviate that. 22, so we'd be, we'd be looking for $300,000 in March. I think we're better off keeping it in reserve as recommended by the selectmen. Yeah, I think it's a, it's a bird in the hand and I think we're about to hear from the Board of Ed that um, their expenses are expected to blossom. So we're, we would be happy to we'd give it to people to ask them back for that and more next year. Um, so I think it's better to put it to work now safely. I have a question though. Haven't we budgeted for sick leave retirement and facilities projects already? In the in the 2020 21 budget, what we do is we um, for retirement sick leave, for instance, um, we have a, a pretty short list of employees who are even eligible for that. Um, that you know, employees, newer employees, um, don't even have that benefit. So we have a short list of people, and we we sort of estimate how much. Um, we might need for retirements each year and we come up with a number and then and then we look to this reserve we're talking about and and we first subtract what we have in our reserve um, and then we only ask to budget for the difference or the delta of what we need uh, so this year um, we even though we had some retirements they're kind of going over into the new year like our police chief for instance um, his, his retirement sick leave isn't um, getting paid out until this week. So what we somewhat budgeted for last year is really occurring in this year. Um, but yes, Jonathan, we do budget for that. It's, it's always a, a guess because we don't often know who is retiring. Sometimes we get a heads up um, and sometimes we don't. So, um, but we would first look to use the money in the reserve fund um, <laughs> before we would ask for any more. And then the surplus, doesn't it imply that we budgeted too much for 2019, 2020? Correct. Like I stated, the, the police chief, the way his retirement ended up happening, um, it did linger into the, the new year. So we're actually, that payout is going out now, um, as opposed to last year when we had originally anticipated it. It was really a timing issue. Yeah, if, if, if the chief retired earlier, we would have paid it in last year. So we, we this wouldn't even be an issue. But Correct. now it goes after July 1st. Now we just have to transfer it over into this fiscal year. So, my, you know, my fear is that we just continue to budget this way. You know, we're just going to end up with a surplus next year 
you know, it's just getting to the point where we're just overtaxing the taxpayer, you know, year after year, overtaxed by a million, overtaxed by two million. We're going to drain it this year. Is don't, next? Don't, will we don't, don't worry about it. We'll be using it next year. We'll use it. We'll use it. I think we had that conversation in the last budget cycle. We talked about the fact that we were going to need to use this coming up this year and then even probably next year um, so that we could relieve the taxpayer through right. a couple budget cycles. So I think this is all you, this is all stuff that we agreed on before. Well, we're kind of getting ahead of ourselves when we overcharge them by $2 million and then tell them that we'll hold on to it to give them some relief for some year to come. That year to come is here. Yeah, I mean, I think we all know that every single business, including government, is suffering this year and is going to suffer next year. So I, I think we made a really sound decision as a board when we voted for the budget. And, and when we come to you with these budgets, we're doing it to the best of our ability. Um, you know, if we had a crystal ball and knew when all of this was going to happen, you know, maybe we wouldn't have asked for this $100,000 $100, extra last year. But, um, you know, we never sit around the table and say, hey, let's jack this number up so we can have a surplus. That doesn't happen. You know, we, we can show you how we come up with all of these numbers um, at like I said, to the best of our ability. And, you know, sometimes it works. Uh, sometimes we have extra and sometimes we have to come back for even more. Um, but again, we're, we're all doing just the best we can to come up with the numbers in the beginning. I can't help but yeah, I agree so. that the art, art and business of budgeting is, is a little of both and, and Guilford's done a pretty fine job. But over the last few years, we've, we've resulted in surpluses that have overtaxed the taxpayer. But again, when we budget, we're not, we have no information on what the state is going to do. So, you know, you, you have a number that you're supposed to get from the state. It doesn't mean we're going to get it. So to Mary agree. Jane's I point, agree. we wish we, we had it at the time. time. Yeah, we made an estimate at the time. I, I didn't want it to be as conservative, but yeah. we I made, would, you know, it was I a would. difficult guess to see, you know, what the state was really going to do. And that occurs year after year. Yeah. But we just keep consistently ending up with these surpluses and then we conveniently find a way to push it into the next budget. Why not give it back? Well, I'd like to remind you of what the tax increase was this year or going into next year. 0.8. So I don't think that's uh, overtaxing number one, knowing what we're about to face. Um, I also would rather have the money in unassigned mm -hmm. than have to go back and say, oh, shit. Oh, sorry. I... <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what we would You're do. You're among friends. We yeah. all, well, yeah, the viewing public will later go, oh, <laughs> chair of the board of finance has got a dirty mouth. Yeah. Um, say, oh, crap. Um, you know, we got to uh, increase taxes and do a 4.5 or 5% increase uh, because we didn't uh, budget enough. So now we have to you know, kick everything in the gear next year. We're in a really good place long term. This long term is not going to last very long. So uh, that's part of the reason why we have Dr. Val Tracy and Dr. Freeman on uh, this evening, because I think we're going to be having more meetings and spending a little bit more time with them, because they've been having so much fun that we feel that we should help them out a little bit. Well, I'd like to give it back. And we have enough assigned balance, unassigned balance on hand you know, for any kind of uh, contingency that might come up. Agreed. And we're just, we're Agreed. just holding on to too much taxpayer money. Except Agreed. that we're going to be using that taxpayer money next year to cover the shortfalls. And, and then we have to, and remember that whatever we take out of the unassigned fund balance, we'll have to replenish at some point. And that comes from the taxpayers. So having the surplus is helping us in the, in the as we've said, when we adopted the budget, this is the rainy day. It's coming. We know so it's you're here. so certain we'll have the shortages, though. I, think I, I haven't heard what we're about to hear from the Board of Finance, but based on what I'm hearing, uh, anecdotally, yeah, we're going to need the money. Yeah. yeah. I, think I think we, we should, should probably just hear from the Board of Ed uh, and then uh, make and have a discussion, maybe. Uh, sorry, sorry uh, Chairman. 
didn't I would, I would no agree. no that's all right i interjected but and not, my battery's running so low we better hear from the chairman <laughs> okay is there anything else on the summary sheet otherwise i'm going to read two motions to make it easier for everybody um and i'm not going to read all the numbers because anybody can get this particular form as part of our agenda um so I'm going to ask for a motion to approve operating budget transfers totaling $476,486 from the Police Department, Employee Benefits, and Parks and Recreation to the following departments, Building, Economic Development, Fire, and Capital, as indicated in the summary provided under this agenda item. Uh, I'd like to vote by roll call, so I'm just going to go right through. Um, Megan Scanlon? Aye. Veronica Wallace? Aye. Ken Gammerman? Aye. Mike Ailes, aye. Jeff Beatty, Aye. Jonathan Trotta? Nay. Bob Hartman? Aye. Okay, thank you. Um, I don't believe there's any abstentions or recusals to this, but I ask anyway. Uh, the second motion is going to approve budget transfers totaling $298,800 from employee benefits, library department, and town properties to the following fund balances. Assigned fund balance for reserve for personnel, committed fund balance for sick leave retirement, and committed fund balance for facilities projects as indicated in the summary provided under this agenda item. Uh, again, vote by roll call. So I'll go through Megan Scanlon. Aye. Veronica Wallace. Aye. Ken Gammerman. Aye. Mike Ailes. Aye. Jeff Beatty. Aye. Jonathan Trotta. Nay. Bob Hartman. Aye. That one, you know, honestly, I could say that one, I could understand, Jonathan, why you would say that, but the operating budget transfers, it's just basically shifting money and allocating. Uh, it's, it's, your, it's your decision, I'm just questioning it. Moving on, item number six, we are uh, fully uh, joined now by the Board of Education, so we can move on to that. So uh, review and accept report of expenditures for the Board of Education. Again, we have two fiscal years. Uh, so I know Linda, you've been on listening and uh, Ted Sands has joined us um, as the reviewer for the month of July. So I will hand the floor over to you, uh, both of you. Um, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, let's do fiscal year 2019-2020 uh, first. Um, this is the, uh, uh, in, in effect, the closeout of the year uh, occurred uh, in July. Uh, the expenditures were uh, $220,811.33. Uh, expenditures and encumbrances through the end of the year were 99.58% of budget as compared to 99.97% in the prior year, the fiscal year ended with an unexpended funds of $254,644.53, which I would suggest to you exceeded uh, Linda's uh, previous estimate. So she did a very good job for us this year. Um, Basically, this was uh, just uh, catching up on uh, invoices that came in late uh, when they had to harass some of these vendors to get their stuff in, but uh, we, we did get enough in that we were able to close. And there were no real uh, unusual items in the, uh, uh, in the statements, but I'd be happy to answer questions. Uh, Linda's here and she has more detail, but uh, if anybody has questions, we're, we're happy to, to entertain have, them at this point. I have a couple of questions. Yes, sir. Uh, what accounts for the two, can, can we have a very brief summary as to why we had $255,000 unexpended? Well, I think that, um, as you know, the, the schools were not in in-person session 
for part of the year. And uh, during that part of the year, uh, we went back to some of the vendors and uh, shall we say negotiated some discounts off of uh, expected uh, bills, primarily in the transportation area, both our regular bus company and uh, the uh, special ed bus runs. Since the buses weren't running, we uh, negotiated a discount there. We weren't using fuel, so we had some savings there. Um, and uh, some of the special ed schools um, did not, uh, you know, they, they weren't functioning and uh, as a result, uh, we weren't paying them. So I think that while we incurred some additional expenses, the, there were offsetting savings and that we hadn't counted on because this whole virus thing has kind of made the budget very difficult. I have a second question that comes out of this related to tuition. Uh, yeah. The tuition was, is down by a hundred and eight thousand dollars right. yet and I, I just wondered how we got how we achieved those uh savings or reductions because uh, at least two of the outside tuition agencies i think it was the grove school and another one the hope hope academy they fully billed us there must have been some that did not bill us and i wondered why some Linda, I, Linda can provide you with a better answer on that one because we asked the same question at the operations committee. So there were a couple things that occurred to make the tuition under budget. Um, first, there were a couple students um, that did not complete the full year. Um, they were eligible to graduate, so they opted to graduate early. That resulted in some savings. There were some movements um, throughout the year of some facilities that brought us some savings. There was also some savings from um, the STRIVE program, which is the alternative uh, 18 to 21 year old program. Uh, they only billed us for four students, which was the practice that they had always done. We had four slots, we paid for four. Um, I was anticipating that we were going to be billed for the six that we had attending and they did not bill us for those. That was a savings of almost $70,000 right there. So all these things together, little bits here and there, and then that big savings resulted in the under budget of 108000 Are we likely to get billed for those other two students some point down the road or they've decided not to bill us at all for them? No, they're not going to bill us for it. Um, we double checked book right before the end of the year to make sure we didn't have another bill that was going to surprise us and they said no great linda while we're at that I, one last item which was site improvement site improvement we went over yes. what specific areas of site improvement did that figure does that figure cover um i don't have a breakdown of the costs um with me it, there were a number of projects that we started to do um, what, because the schools were closed. So because there was no students in the building, we were able to get some projects done. We continued to do some work in various buildings, um, parking lot at Adams, the uh, work in Baldwin, some other work inside the buildings. So there was a lot of maintenance and, and projects done throughout all, most of the schools. So we took advantage. We we tried to take advantage of the buildings being unpopulated to get the work done so that we were getting ahead of the maintenance work rather than falling behind. The kind of project that could be done without students in attendance. Carpet replacement, bathroom work, that sort of thing that we could do in the building during the week now that we did not have students in the building. Yeah, there's actually a, I, I'm sure this is probably a good portion of them that were planned, but they were moved forward um, in the operating uh, operations committee minutes of July 13th. There was uh, item nine of the exactly facilities right. projects, and there's the Jones HVAC window replacements, Baldwin one uh, and two in terms of phases, Calvin Lee, uh, 
you know, the Adam Middle School parking lot is going to be a big issue, I think, what we're hearing, you know, with, with, with the amount of parent drop off that now is possibly going to happen. So the, the storm um, impact, the storm impacted that project significantly. We needed Eversource to make connections for us and we have lost two weeks of time to Eversource's storm recovery that will impact that project's launch date significantly and unfortunately because of the congestion that we'll be anticipating there. Got it. So you move projects up and then they slow down because of a, because of a storm. Mm -hmm. Never Tropical came storm. Where was your crystal ball on that? Yeah, well, it wasn't even a hurricane. <laughs> yeah, come on. It didn't even rain that yeah, much. I know it wasn't even a wasn't even a big deal. I mean, really? Uh, it was for a lot of people. It wasn't made out to be a big deal. It was a big deal. Um. Okay. Uh, can that answer your questions on that? Anything else on the financials? Don't believe um, if there are no more questions on 2019-2020, uh, then let's move on to July well, uh, of 2020, Ted, which is for Ted. Yeah. Before we do that, I'm gonna I'm gonna stay on this uh, real quick because we just I just want to go through. Um, just, just because it's one line item, it's, it's one item. We're just going to go through and approve it, and then we'll move on to twenty. Um, Fine. Okay. Anything on the warrants? Uh, there were some additional budget transfers in the, that, uh, between line items from the July thirty first memo, and then there's the minutes, operations, and regular and special meeting minutes. Is there anything on any of those items that we have questions on? Any updates on the building assessment? That was the, that survey was supposed to be coming in last that month. One, Linda, was that the one you mentioned before? I think is that the with sight lines. Seth did give. Uh, yeah. Seth, sorry, uh, Cliff did give an update uh, at our operations meeting. I know that it continues to move forward, Jeff. I. I am sorry, I don't have more specific details no, than that. It, it, no, we, we did not get an update from them at operations. That was at the, the standing building committee that they... That draft is in their hands, isn't it? With the preliminary yes. report, and then we asked for some revisions, and uh, we're going to bring the revised report to the operations committee, but we haven't done it yet. No, we haven't seen it. Cliff just updated that we're continuing to effort it and move it forward. We've not received anything at the BOE yet. Okay. All right. Okay, if nothing else, I'm just gonna um, ask for a motion to approve the July expenditures of the Board of Education. That's attributable to the fiscal year 1920 budget in the amount of $220,811.33. So, so moved. Second. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Uh, any abstentions, recusals? Okay, Ted, fiscal year 2021. Now you're on again. <laughs> right. All right. Well, now this month uh, in July, uh, we did have some expenditures of uh, $3,413,060.90. Um, the expenditures and encumbrances through the end of July for this fiscal year were 7.14% of budget compared to 7.00% in the previous year. Um, the, uh, there were a couple of things that uh, I'd like to just explain. The salaries were um, for school administration were somewhat higher than a budget and that's due to um, two factors. One, uh, last year at this time, we had not hired two of our principals. Uh, they were hired later in the uh, summer. So we had, we didn't have those salaries in last year. And then uh, we have this arrangement at the high school where Mr. Massenti will be staying on uh, through the fall to uh, provide uh, a transition 
um, to the uh, new principal. And so we're, we've got a kind of a double salary there for a short period of time. And uh, that, that's what was going on there. Uh, other than that, um, I mean, it's reasonably straightforward. Um, it seems like custodial was up a little bit on salaries too. Is that also due to just preparing the schools? Um, maybe a little, a little bit more than usual or is that? Well, I mean, obviously we're, uh, there, there are two things that are going on. The custodial people are, are really working to, you know, get the schools ready. But also uh, some of this work that was shown on the uh, uh, site improvements, that gets done when if school isn't in session, we can use some of those personnel to do some of these uh, maintenance projects. And so with the school, I mean, this is an opportunity we had never had before. Um, we absolutely uh, jumped on it to get some of these things painted and new carpeting in and things that we, we've been behind on and, and caught up. And so that's why we're using the custodians a little more. Okay. Um, you, did you have other items, Ted, you wanted to go through? I, I kind of stopped you at salaries, but do you have other items? Um, well, I mean, when we come to the supplies, yeah. obviously the custodians, um, that we, we decided to, for next month, we're going to change the way this gets reported because right now, all of the COVID related expenses, um, in terms of, uh, cleaning supplies and masks and all that kind of stuff is being dumped into the same line on custodian supplies as the operating uh, supplies that the custodians use. And next month we'll break those two out and there'll be a separate line for the COVID stuff. Um, but the reason that, we, that that line is so high is obviously uh, related to the virus. Okay. Yeah, beyond that, everything seems to be uh, typical. Uh, anything, uh, anything else on financials? Or I had a question on a warrant. Go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say anything on the warrants. Go ahead, Brian. On page two, there's a um, an invoice for Mark DeAngelis for repairs at the high school for thirty-three hundred dollars. You know, I know he does sidewalk work or something. Is what was that for? Did does anybody know? Uh, I'd refer that to Linda. Second. He was doing some work on the sidewalk in the front of the building, so it's not the, it's the walkway out by the street, not around the property. And I don't know if that was the only, that was this work. Oh no, I, I take it back. This one was for um, repairs to a column at the high school. That's the only notes I have. I can get you more detail if you want, but it wasn't the, the sidewalk will show up next month. Thank you. It, we have bollards at the front of the building that keep the traffic away from the sidewalks. I don't know if we damaged it with one of our um, operations yeah. vehicles. vehicles or whether it would involve somebody else. We'll have to look it up, Veronica. I'll have to trace it down yeah. for you. Yeah, you got a, you got bigger problems. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry I'm that one got biased. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Anything else on um, financials or warrants? Mm -hmm. 
Okay. Uh, with that, uh, I will ask for a motion to accept the report of expenditures of the Board of Education for the month of July 2020 attributable to the fiscal year 2020-21 budget in the amount of $3,413,060.90. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Aye. From John on the phone now. All right. <laughs> That's what I thought. I got gotcha. <laughs> you. Uh, any abstentions or recusals? Okay. I have a general question. General question. Ken, all you. I, I, I hear the disembodied presence of the superintendent of school, so I know that we've got him in the, in the neighborhood. He's here. Uh, I'm, yes, I know. Hello, Paul. Uh, Ken, how are you? I, I wish I were better. <laughs> uh, as far as the, uh, I was looking at the mi the minutes of the July twentieth meeting of the Board of Education, and uh, you were compiling and reporting on the results of the recent survey of parents, and uh, it seems to me that a minutes of July twentieth could be as old as uh, ancient Egypt. So I wondered whether uh, the East factors have played into your thinking or whether there's an update. Uh, I'm thinking specifically about the fact that 65% of your respondents wanted a full school day in person and with present, everybody present and accounted for, and that 37% said that the kids would ride the buses. Uh, I, I think that was like a hundred years ago. It mm -hmm. was in July. Where are you now on this? I'm happy to respond. Um, I, I just, Mr. Chairman or Dr. Balistracy, do either of you want to, to move to a different agenda item or Katie, is there anything that you want to say before I start talking? Because once that, once I start, we could be here. Yeah, till 11 yeah. I, <laughs> Dr. Freeman, that's such a good idea. Uh, no, I do. I do. Uh, also, because I think Karen's going to be like, okay, where do I put this now? Um, if, just let's hold that question for a second, because the reason that um, uh, Katie and Paul are on is to discuss pretty much old business, which is where things are going based on everything we know about uh, school reopening and then also the you know collaboration between our two boards. So I'm just gonna hold that question for a second. Dr. Freeman, hold one second. I'm gonna go to item number seven, committee reports, building permits, anything on building permits? I didn't think so. Um, on number eight, old business. Um, I did want to bring up, I had it here as joint board of ed, board of finance meeting. Um, actually, I do want to kind of change this as an old business item to talk about um, what's very important to, of course, this entire community about the school reopening. Um, we all have different factions and, and segments of this to look at, but of course, on the finance side, we keep talking about what the financial impact is going to be. Um, so, um, if this leads into a discussion about um, further, um, call them uh, intermittent meetings in between our regular meeting to keep abreast of what's going on, um, then so be it. But in the meantime, I would like uh, the Board of Finance to hear a little bit of the, um, you know, where the status is. I know you had a meeting tonight at seven o'clock with the public. Uh, so I'll leave it to both of you and uh, anybody from the Board of Education and Linda to talk about the, the latest on the reopening. So whoever wants to start, it's all yours. Uh, of course, keeping in mind Ken's question. Um, let me just say a few words, but but then turn it over to Dr. Freeman who can give the, the most detailed information. Um, we as a Board of Education have um, chosen to meet almost every Monday night uh, this summer um, so that we could try to provide a continual discussion about the reopening plan um, and provide kind of live information for our parents and for the community uh, as, as we move closer and closer to the beginning of the school year. Um, I have to say as a chair of the Board of Education, uh, the amount of work that is being done by Dr. Freeman, um, by the district leadership team in, in preparing for this coming year is extraordinary. We are um, very lucky citizens in the town of Guilford to have this kind of leadership um, at, at a time when leadership is so crucial. Good leadership is so crucial. Um, we, uh, the State Department of Education, expects 
expected and received from us um, a reopening plan on July 24th. These plans required that we have a full capacity model, a hybrid model, and a remote model, a fully remote model. The full capacity model and the hybrid model allow for any parent to uh, choose for their child or children uh, so, uh, remote learning, even if other students are in school again in the hybrid or full capacity model. Um, it was our understanding um, and the state communication at the time that those models were being developed that the full capacity model would be expected by the state. Um, shortly after uh, districts across the state submitted those plans, uh, the governor um, in, a, um, uh, in a, a statement um, indicated that a uh, hybrid model, considering hybrid model particularly for high school and middle school students, but, th but that uh, districts could consider that as an approach. Um, since that time, uh, Dr. Freeman and his staff have created um, a hybrid model that will be the model that we will use to reopen schools on September 10th with the plan to go full capacity on October 19th should transmission rates in Connecticut stay low. Um, so that is the plan. Uh, very briefly, um, and then again, I'll turn it over to Dr. Freeman. Very briefly, it is a hybrid model in which we divide the student body into two cohorts. Cohort A will attend school in person on Mondays and Tuesdays. All students will be in a remote learning uh, set up on Wednesdays and a deep clean of schools will occur at that time. And then cohort B will attend in person on Thursdays and Fridays. Um, a, a survey has gone out to all parents to um, understand two things. One, whether they intend to keep their children in a remote learning um, setup, even though we as a school district are going with a hybrid design. And two, to indicate if there is um, a, a parent work-related reason why it would be better for uh, their particular student or students to, to be in cohort A or in cohort B. Um, as you can imagine, these cohorts are being created so that siblings, um, children in the same household are all going on the same days, will be in the same cohort. Um, that is kind of a high level introduction um, to, to where we are. There are specific uh, school specific plans being created by our um, uh, administrators at each building. Um, those will be uh, communicated to the students and the parents of those buildings as they are finalized. Um, so I will now turn it over to to Dr. Freeman uh, for a more detailed update. Thank you, Dr. Ballastracy. Uh, Mr. Gammerman, to your question, um, the information that we received from the parents early on has been refined uh, in response to that latest survey that Dr. Ballastracy just referenced. Uh, we find that as of this moment, there are um, uh, 344 students who will, will not be returning into the hybrid model, but staying home for full distance instruction. That represents about 11% of our student population. The way that we have designed to approach support of those students is that we'll be creating grade level assignments or team assignments or schedules at the high school as we always have. Teachers will support the 90% of the students who are in their class attending in person on any given day, while they also support the 10% of the students who may be at home. This affords us the flexibility to be able to move very flexibly up and down that continuum that Dr. Ballastracy detailed, so that we plan on opening in the hybrid fashion. Uh, we have a target five weeks out so that if numbers remain um, positive and low, 
on October 19th, we will transition almost seamlessly into the fully reopened model. The students that the teachers had been supporting at home on this alternating schedule will now simply be together in class in front of those teachers. But even if the numbers took a turn and became more concerning in Connecticut, and we at, at that time or at any, any time needed to in fact retreat to a fully distance model, again, the teachers would be in a position to be fully supporting those students and we could move seamlessly up and down that continuum. It in fact would allow us the flexibility if necessary, should we have an identified case in one elementary school in one grade level, you could have one teacher and 20 students who could very seamlessly stay home for two weeks of quarantine and if the teacher was well and asymptomatic continue instruction we could have one school that needed to go distance if they needed a two-week quarantine while the other six remained in session so the design that we've put in place allows us one the flexibility to be able to support students as seamlessly as possible Two, we feel that by keeping the students at home tied to a specific grade or class of peers, that it has the best opportunity of keeping them um, moving at the same pace with other classmates and not falling behind if we were to put them into a wholly divorced distance academy of some kind. And three, we really believe that our plan with a delayed opening until September 10th and, and not shifting into a full reopening until that target date of October 19th allows us also to be thoughtful and to watch the numbers in Connecticut. And we can see if there's any movement as schools begin to reopen uh, around the state and even here in Guilford in a partial status before going fully open. Um, to Dr. Balistracy's point about the work that has gone into this, all of this has necessitated some planning and some spending that was unbudgeted um, when we ultimately approved our budget. And Ken, it does seem like more than 100 years ago when we were talking with you about how we were going to approve um, our budget and the town budget moving forward. Um, we don't have figures for you tonight, but to give you a sense of the ways that we're looking at spending and some of the areas in which we have begun accruing some, some costs, um, obviously we're looking at equipment and materials. We have been purchasing cleaning supplies and in fact attempting to purchase different tools and cleaning devices that will allow us to be more efficient when it comes to uh, spraying and disinfecting high touch surfaces around the building. Obviously PPE is going to be an expense. We are asking the families to share that expense. We have put washable and reusable masks on our materials list. So as well as purchasing pens and erasers and markers, we're asking every family to supply their children with masks when they come to work. But we will be stocking in PPE. If a child misplaces or forgets or soils a mask during the school day, we will have disposable child side masks, size masks that we'll provide. We're not going to allow a child to miss instruction because they misplace a, a mask or, or soil a mask during a lunch break. So we will have those available. We are providing masks to staff members. We are providing them with the limited number of washable, reusable masks. But again, for staff members, we will also be stocking in disposables should they need those um, at any time. We're stocking in higher levels of PPE for special areas in the school. Uh, following the state plan, we will be opening a second nurse's room in every building, uh, what's being identified as an isolation room. Um, right now, if a child falls on the playground and skins her knee, they go into a nurse's office that has a desk that sits right next to a cot. And if we have two cots, they're separated by a shower curtain. If we have a student during the school day who begins to experience flu-like symptoms or begins to show a fever, we're not gonna put that child in the nurse's office with a child who just skinned her knee. So we will be opening an isolation room. And if students have a fever or flu-like symptoms, they will be held in that space until their parents can come pick them up and retrieve them from school. Anybody who works in that setting or anybody who enters that setting with the students would have access to N95s, face shields, and much higher grades of PPE than the regular classroom teachers. We'll have some special education settings where we have students who are working on behavioral skills, students who may at times become aggressive in their behaviors, or students who may have sensitivity issues and have a difficulty wearing a mask during the school day. In any of those settings, teachers and, and aides who work in those settings will have access to that higher grade of PPE. We're stocking in a bunch of options. We're bringing in the, the clear face shields as well as the full masks. 
We've bought a bunch of these ridiculous full masks that have plastic cutouts in the front so children can see that you're smiling behind the mask. Um, we're experimenting with a lot of different styles and so that our teachers in the first few weeks or months will tell us what works best, will tell us what's most comfortable and what facilitates instruction best. And then we hope to be able to stock in those items, the choices that they find most successful. So significant expenses um, that were unbudgeted there. There are furniture and furniture modification expenses, just like every other build, uh, business in Guilford and around the country now. We're installing plexiglass dividers at all of our reception desks in many of the classroom settings. Um, I don't know if the community is aware, but we've spent about 30 years in Guilford getting rid of individual student desks, and we've been buying furniture that actually facilitates collaboration and cooperation. Um, Mr. Ailes is smiling and nodding because we did a study with the Herman Miller Corporation about the right type of furniture to buy. Well, it was right for teaching and learning. It was wrong for COVID. So in many settings, we are buying plexiglass dividers that students will be able to set up on pieces of shared furniture so that if you're sitting across a table from some other student, there will be a plexiglass divider between the two of you. Um, and we're buying, again, different models and different versions so that we can experiment with what works best. For teachers, we're buying a variety of different plexiglass dividers that they may be able to stand on a lectern or a standing height desk that they could then stand behind and give them the ability with appropriate distance to take a mask off so that the student can so that the students can see their facial expressions. It's really hard to communicate with people who are wearing masks. I find myself all the time smiling at people in the supermarket to let them know that I'm okay with them walking the wrong way up and down the aisle. And I keep forgetting that they can't see that I'm smiling at them. They don't know if I'm glaring at them or, or saying hello. So we're going to have a lot of experimentation around furniture and, and PPE in those settings. We're looking to purchase a tent at every building so that we can create more outdoor space. Uh, students are going to need access to mask breaks. They're going to need to be able to go outside into a large area in the fresh air where they can confidently gain six feet apart from each other and take their masks off for 15 or 20 minutes. That's going to be hard in New England in just a few weeks. So we're looking to bring in a tent at every location so that we can extend the, the opportunity to do that even in inclement weather. We're looking at bringing in tents that in the beginning, first weeks of school will be um, coverings only, but we'll have the opportunity to actually allow us to put up side panels. And we've actually spoken with the chief about the ability to possibly install heaters in those later in the year so we can extend those opportunities. We're looking at one in every building right now. I need to tell you that we've got parents that think we should half a dozen, have half a dozen at every location because they think all classroom instruction should be taking place outdoors all the time until we, until we get our arms around this. Uh, we're making um, technology expenditures. We're looking to purchase a, um, uh, an ancillary camera for every classroom teacher so that when they do have those two or four students who are at home, they'll have the ability to actually live stream the direct instructional components of the lessons to the students who are at home in real time. I hate to use the word, but I found myself using it, the lecture portion of the class. If the teacher is in front of the classroom sharing information and using the smart board, we're purchasing portable cameras that will allow them to live stream that so that 16 kids can participate in class and four can be watching from home. And in fact, not just watching, but engaging in conversations then through platforms like this one. So those are all just the equipment and supply purchases that we've been looking at. We also have been incurring costs or will be incurring costs. We haven't actually started accruing them yet, but we're planning on them around staff. Um, the, the state plan makes it very clear that the expectations on the school buses are likely to require us to have monitors on the school buses. So currently, while we pay for a driver on every bus, we're likely going to be increasing the costs to two employees on every bus rather than one employee on every bus, at least in the early days of the school year, at least as we teach the students the new expectations and the new protocols for riding the bus. We're hopeful that we may be able to re release those positions once we've established the expectations and that the drivers will then be able to maintain them. 
we're looking into adding um, additional recess aids, additional lunch aids. Lunches K through eight are going to be served in the classrooms so that we maintain separation and cohorting among the students. But we used to serve four lunch waves you know, in the, in the cafeteria. We're now gonna have 16 discrete lunches being served across most of our elementary schools and more than that at the middle schools. So there's gonna be a need to have people to help to supervise and, and clean in those settings. Obviously, we're bringing on additional custodial positions during the school day. We're going to need to increase cleaning of bathroom facilities as they're used during the day. And the way that we just described serving lunch is much more labor intensive than what we have done in the past. Uh, we're looking to bring on a medical aid at every building, uh, somebody who will be primarily responsible for um, monitoring and staffing that isolation room that we mentioned as well as facilitating the work of the school nurses at each building when that's not required. We have building subs that we staff in on a regular basis. We know that there's gonna be absenteeism at the buildings on a regular basis. In a normal year, we have a building sub is somebody who shows up every day because we know we're gonna need at least one sub every day. We've got one at the elementaries, two at the middles, and I believe there's three at the high school. We're doubling those numbers this year because we know we're going to have need to have people who can be flexible and move in to cover those positions. And as Jason Bowden through the HR office has begun meeting with any teacher who feels that he or she has a qualifying condition that may preclude them from being able to work, and we're actually anticipating that we may see requests for unpaid leaves of absence or unanticipated resignations as we get closer to the beginning of the school year, retirements and resignations. We're anticipating a significant increase in the cost around long-term or permanent substitutes as we open the school year. We anticipate that we're gonna have teachers um, who may end up retiring or unable to return or running out 12 weeks of FMLA or emergency FMLA. So we're anticipating um, some significant unanticipated costs in the areas of, um, of long-term or permanent substitutes. None of that touches on the fact that we're also anticipating increased costs around special education costs this year. Um, across the, the state, and I believe across the country, you're going to see special education students who while they continued to receive service from March through June and across the summer may have seen gaps develop because that service was being delivered in a distance format and may not have translated um, as well as we would have hoped. So we are anticipating that we will see increasing special educational needs, whether it's um, contracted services in district, uh, whether we might see increased costs associated with outplacements or unanticipated outplacements, legal costs as we work through those needs as they're brought to us um, by the parents and negotiated through the school system, um, but there could be a number of unanticipated costs in those areas. I know that I put not a single number to any of that because quite honestly, we're working right now to get all the pieces in place to open the buildings uh, successfully and be able to transition our kids calmly and smoothly into the school year. Um, and Linda's working really hard to keep up with me as I'm approving spending and she's trying to put numbers to it. We will be able to break that down and give you a projection at some point soon, but we're not prepared to do that tonight. We did, however, want to take advantage of your invitation so that we could explain the types of things that we're, we're looking at and give you at least um, an idea of the type of spending that we're engaging in, although I haven't put any dollars to it. Do you have any sense of the, any estimate of the number of uh, current faculty that are going to opt out of the school year? No, we've probably received about 60 contacts, uh, individual contacts through Jason Bowden's office. Um, Jason then needs to meet with each of those individuals specifically. Um, and, then, and then what we're working to do, and it really is individual, uh, we need to identify what concerns that person has, medical or otherwise, that are making it difficult for them to complete their job. We're required by labor law to work to reach a reasonable accommodation to allow them to continue to be able to serve their job function. And it really does come down to this individual fit based mm -hmm. on their job description, job function and responsibility and the nature of the condition that they're bringing forward, often medical, but not exclusively medical. And so sometimes it involves a lot of creativity. It might simply be as simple as 
a higher grade of PPE, it could, it could require a lot more creativity than that. So we will work through those, but no, we don't expect it to be a, a, a huge number. Um, but I'm also, you know, I'm worried about, um, I'm worried about a late August surprise. This is stressful for some folks. And so people who may not have been considering retirement may reconsider it in very short order and surprise us in the last few weeks. Well, in your survey back in July, uh, you reported that 42% of the staff members had concerns. That's a, that's a high number. Yep, and they thought that they had a concern that could fall in any of those categories, medical, childcare, even transportation. There was a whole list of possible qualifying conditions. And then as each person comes forward, they meet with Jason and go through that whole list and all of the detail that is built into the regular FMA law, the emergency FMLA law that's been extended, the time that's available through, um, through the, the COVID extensions. They go through each one of those and figure out what is available, if anything is available. Um, and we know that it's not a generous offer, but we do know uh, as we meet with many of our bargaining units, if there are folks who can afford to and request a year's leave of absence, then that is something that we intend to try to honor as often as we can. Again, we know that most people won't have the ability to do that, um, but there are people who have asked about that as an option. Thank you. There's a, a lot of moving parts. We've never been this deep into a summer and this um, unfinished. Usually we've got student schedules done before the last day of school um, and we're just working on them. We have begun, uh, we've had at least an initial meeting with all of our six bargaining units. We are beginning the second round of more detailed negotiating um, with each of those. We've got to negotiate these midstream impacts to working conditions um, that this plan has put into effect. And while I haven't seen it, it's my understanding that um, CEA, not GEA, but that the Connecticut Education Association uh, has released a plan earlier tonight with their recommendations. And so I'm going to imagine that that's gonna become part of our bargaining locally when we sit down to talk with the local group here. I do need to say the local group here and the teachers here have been exemplary. Today I hosted the second full faculty meeting in the district. We hosted it by Zoom. We invited all 350 some teachers. We had over a hundred who attended. And for two hours, we talked about the plan and about the opening and the details that go into it. That's the second such full faculty meeting that we've held. We've hosted about six um, um, focus group meetings with teachers to get their input and their, their feedback. Uh, we've had a group of teachers who have been teaching what we've called learning pathways over the summer. Um, we offer summer programming normally. We quadrupled the enrollment of the summer programming this year, uh, and we did it for only twice the cost of what we would normally do because much of it was distance. We're taking the learning from that summer program and rolling it into the opening and the training for the teachers as we open up this year. Um, the teachers have been fantastic, and the principals have been simply Herculean. The work that they have put in this summer um, has been admirable, and they deserve a lot of credit for how, how, they ha how hard they have all worked this summer to help us be ready. Dr. Freeman, I just wanted to understand, uh, in October, when you transfer out of the hybrid model, you'll have all the students coming into school at the same time? So there's a bit of a nuance to the language, but in October, we will be opening all the schools for five full days of school, and we will be inviting all of the students to attend. At the same time, the state has made clear to us that any families who choose to keep their students at home, we need to continue to meet the needs of those children through a distance platform, giving them full access, but not requiring them to enter the building. And as of today, we've got uh, 344 or approximately 11% of our population who have informed us that they do not intend to return. Now that number is gonna be fluid. The other thing is that we can't require uh, families or students to make that decision and then commit to it one way or the other through the school year. A child who is attending personally can choose to shift to remote learning and a child who's in remote learning can choose to enter the schools physically um, just as a child who moves into Guilford in the middle of the school year gains access, we can't tell them to wait till the next September. So we know that those numbers are going to move, and I would, I, you know, I believe they're going to move based on the kind of confidence that we can build in the community around the protocols we're putting in place in the schools. 
but clearly they're going to be impacted by the numbers here on the ground in Connecticut, as well as the national conversation around uh, COVID and testing and school reopening. Okay. Yep. I can, you know, I can see this uh, choice for re remote learning as, you know, probably being positive because uh, certain people have different health risks, of course, and, and you know what they're facing with the, the risk of the virus. Um, I'm curious too. I, I see this uh, kind of like a robot unit uh, on on television in use in some schools. I think we may even have one. Do we have several of those robots that the student can actually use a, a robot to go from class to class with a camera? We, we have one, and we used it about nine years ago when we had an individual student who, for health reasons, could not get to school, and we were able to at that time buy a specialized software with a special device. We installed it on their home television. That child was able to participate in live streaming from his living room and move around the building with his classmates. And in fact, uh, there was a fire drill in the building one day and his students took that robot outside with, him, with them because that was him and he needed to leave just like they needed to leave. Uh, with 344 students in that situation, and remember, Jonathan, during the hybrid phase, we will have all of our students in that situation half of every week, or actually three-fifths of every week. So while we don't use the robot device anymore, platforms like Zoom, Google Classroom, and Google Hangouts afford us this same opportunity. I can't tell you how many times I've wondered out loud what would have happened if this virus had hit 10 years ago before we had the communication tools that we have available to us now. Uh, we achieve much the same thing with Zoom meetings and Google Classroom. We don't have the physical presence of the, um, of the robot, but you can put four of these Brady Bunch boxes up on the whiteboard in the front of the classroom. That can be the four students who are home who are looking at the 16 students who are sitting in the classroom, and you can achieve a similar kind of student discourse. The breakout room function in, in Zoom is fantastic to allow small group conversations to happen. We can have two students in the classroom and one student who's at home participating simply through the Chromebook. Um, but the one-to-one -one Chromebook initiative that we rolled out, I don't know if that was two or three or four years ago anymore, but getting Chromebooks to the level that every student in the district had access to one and then the Zoom and the Google and the WebEx and all of the other platforms that have been out there have really facilitated that kind of sharing. You know, it seems like, uh, you know, your, your thought process is great. I guess it's a little more economical to use the, the camera and, and the Zoom meeting. The robot does seem like a pretty elegant solution, though, and I was wondering if maybe CARES or FEMA might finance, you know, some of those for us. Again, John, uh, you know, I, I, I was part just of the... Thought. Um, no, I think it's interesting, right? I know that our, our robot had a, the same robot that we had in district had a cameo appearance in Iron Man 2 all those years ago. Um, but, you know, remember, um, the Dalio Foundation spent about $23.9 million back in March to buy 60,000 laptop computers that were pushed out to high school students in the 33 Alliance districts. Um, and half of our school system, a full 1,600 students are gonna be learning from home every day during those first six weeks of school to, to try to purchase the 1,600 robots that it would take to have that function and then have them not be needed when we opened it, w it would be kind of cool, and it, it might hook a few people, but just not just not an efficient it, use it, of the It might be, might be overkill, huh? <laughs> I think so. Yeah. I think we're getting a little bit into Terminator territory, Jonathan. Dr. Freeman. Well, uh, us taxpayers did give Dalio a lot of money just to move his office from one place in Connecticut to another, so I'm glad we got some, some laptops out of it. Milford didn't see any of those laptops, but the 33 neediest oh. districts in the state, the 33 neediest districts in the state got a lot of help for their students who were at home through that donation. I've got two quick questions that I've been asked that I'd like to answer for people. One is a simple technical one. All this broadcasting, uh, do you have the bandwidth? So that's a really good question. It's one of the things that keeps me up at night. 
Um, so at the high school, it's no problem. Uh, at all of the at all of the school locations, we have no interest. We've got better bandwidth bringing information down into the building. Right. We're we're not as set up to be pushing information out. Nobody anticipated this. At the high school, we've got carbon fiber. Uh, car it should be no issue. We should have no concerns at the high school. Maybe not carbon fiber. Maybe fiber optic <laughs> is what I'm talking about. Um, at the yep, elementary fiber schools. Optic, yeah. Yep. At the at the elementary schools, the numbers are low enough that we're low enough that we're not concerned. Our biggest concerns right now are at the two middle schools, and I did not get an update today, but I know that uh, Mr. Mitchell has been working on solving that problem, and he's been working to run the fiber that we need from the building out to the street to address those issues there. Those are the pinch points that we're worried about. We're working on a solution, and we're keeping our fingers crossed that we'll have it up and ready to go. I don't and know. Sorry, no, I, I, I'm, it's going to be fabulous if you get that to, to work for all for all at once, and I'm sure you will. And the other, the $62 million question, of course, is what happens when a, when a child presents with COVID? Um, what do we do? Yep. Um, so before I move on to that one, the last thing I'll note is it's important. I'm trying to say this everywhere I can. When we talk about the live streaming piece, we want to be very clear that we're not expecting every teacher to be live streaming every class in its entirety from beginning to end. We're actually saying that it's just those overt instructional components. It's only the pieces that lend themselves to the tool and to the platform. And we've, we for years have been making it clear that that kind of instruction should never be more than 20 minutes long. We don't deliver two our lectures in our school system. So hopefully, even if we don't get the full solution in place, we don't have all of our teachers all on all at the same time. But to the other question, um, the answer is it depends. Uh, the, the state and DPH, the State Department of Ed and DPH have just put out a series of scenarios in, a, in their most recent document. And we've worked on a flow chart um, that says if this, then this. But the way the plan is built should allow for us hopefully to be able to compartmentalize that kind of positive identification. So if a student in one of our elementary schools, for instance, was found to be positive for COVID, the way we're building the cohorting around the students, not just the AB cohort during the hybrid, but the fact that we're really keeping students together in isolated groups. We're not doing grade level lunches or grade level recesses. They're staying in that classroom group for almost all their time together. We hope that should we have a positive identification, we might be able to say that these 20 students and these two or three teachers have been exposed to a possible positive. We might be able to simply quarantine those 20 students and their teachers only. And if the teachers are well and asymptomatic while they're going through their quarantine, simply shift that group to full distance learning. The model would allow for that ha to happen at a grade level it would allow it for it to happen at one school, but possibly not all seven. And I think you will clearly see, and you know, as we move into the fall, I hope we don't, but I think it's likely that you may see individual communities that shift to what the state is calling the short closings, where a whole community may shift to fully distance learning while we go through a two or three or four week um, separation period to allow any kind of, and, and if we're not seeing community transmission after those two or three or four weeks, then returning everybody back in. So the rest of the state may continue to attend while individual communities or schools or classrooms have the ability to drop into a quarantine setting. The real answer though, is that each case, each case is gonna be unique and we are going to manage it locally in coordination with our Department of Public Health. Thank you. Um, question, I, uh, one main question about how this is going to be tracked. I think one of the questions we're going to get <clears throat> over a period of time is, of course, well, how much, how much did this cost? How much did this pandemic cost us? What's the differential? Um, do you have any ideas? Or thought, I mean, how is that going to be tracked? I know the town is doing the COVID, you know, line tracking and I know it's going to be hard probably to really, in some cases, separate what is truly COVID related expenditures versus not. But how is the Board of Education going to do that? And of course, you know, I got to be careful of how I couch that because, you know, we're, you know, you know we um, accept the budget. We don't necessarily nitpick the budget, but it'd be interesting. How are you going to track it so that we can say 
in the future, this was a $1.1 million uh, overage in expenditures because of the pandemic versus, well, we think it's about this um, because I think that's going to be a big question later on um, well, we're, what, the, what that separation is. Mike, I think it's an important question too because you want to keep those uh, expenses separate in case they're reimbursed. Exactly. We're tracking right. that both to be able to answer your question, Mr. Ailes, but also so that we can submit for FEMA reimbursement or we can make sure that we get every penny out of the CARES money that as little as it was, we had a little that came our way or any, any other round, uh, whether it's the HEROES money or whatever comes next. So Linda is working to track those. We haven't broken them out right now because again, we're just rushing to try to stay ahead of the demands every day, but we will be able to break those out and detail those out both to answer the question locally and to be able to report for any possible reimbursement or relief funds that become available. Uh, this Linda, question is kind of for everyone. Me. Is there an expiration on those programs that reimburse us for COVID expenses? So maybe a question for, for anyone in the know. Well, Linda's nodding, so I'll tell you yes. that she's nodding yes, Jonathan. Um, so there, there, it expires at some point? There, right now, there is an expiration on the CARES fund. Um, it's expenditures through a certain point, and then we have a certain time to submit them. Um, the date has changed, and I'm hearing that it might change again, so I don't want to give a specific date, but it does have an end. Now Mary Jane's nodding. <laughs> okay. Yes, so advantageous to, to, to get our target. advantageous to get our purchases in, in line that we think we need to, to get them expended and, and possibly reimbursed. Well, one of, the, I, one of oh. the things that FEMA is doing different this time than any other time in, in history is they um, are accepting uh, reimbursement requests on a quarterly basis. So, for instance, we have a, a we have a hurricane like we had. Uh, the tropical storm. We accumulate all of our things and we have one shot to get those reimbursed. For COVID, it's um, a continual quarterly um, reimbursement. So we're currently finalizing our June 30 reimbursement. And then for this quarter, we'll be doing that um, you know, at the end of the quarter. So FEMA is anticipating each quarter to receive um, reimbursement requests from the cities and towns. So they they understand what we're going through uh, during this. Hmm. Okay, so it sounds like it doesn't expire so well, quickly. Not, there, there, on the care side, like Linda said, there there are current um, expiration dates, and that that date keeps moving. Um, just just like us, you know, when they have the funding, they say, okay, well, you know, in, in April, they say, okay, well, we're going to give you through the end of June because we'll all be back to work by then. Well, then that doesn't happen, so they move it. They keep moving it. So in the same way, the school is uh, working with a, a moving target on how they're doing things. We are, we're experiencing the same exact thing with, with the funding um, on the reimbursement side. So it's really a moving target target and we just trying to keep up with it so that we can at least get everything that we're entitled to. I think the point though is that regardless of what that expiration date is, you're going to meet it. Oh, correct. Oh, absolutely. So if, if it keeps <laughs> moving, you're not going to miss the expiration date. So if it keeps moving, you know you have a little bit more time, a little bit more time. And then when that doesn't get moved, I'm sure it'll be, okay, this is the date. But they're, they're, they're giving plenty of notice when those expiration dates are coming right. up. Right, so, and right. so the reason the CARES Act keeps moving forward is because the CARES Act only comes into play after we've gone to FEMA. So uh, that the CARES Act was, and the HEROES Act really was put into place to cover that 25% that FEMA doesn't um, cover. So everything needs to go through FEMA before it can go through um, the additional state funding. So as, as the targets move forward, they, they move together. Okay, theoretically, we may be able to recover the difference between what we budgeted for the school year and what is additional spending related to COVID. Hopefully, in some cases. Yeah, as yeah. I tell every single department, you know, we, I tell every department, 
put put everything you know that's COVID related together um, and and provide it to my office. And we're going to do everything we, in our power to receive whatever reimbursement we can. And as and we, we all know, as we all know, reimbursement and, and and that type of funding is usually not a hundred percent. So right. correct. Yeah. FEMA is only seventy five percent, and and I've been working with Linda um, as one of the departments of the town. So I have all of the June thirty um, information from the school already to to which is going to be part of our first submission. Okay, so for our superintendent again, um, with the um, possibility of, of not having teachers uh, being able to work be, uh, because of different risks for COVID, uh, will we be able to find the replacement teachers? That's another one that of the things be... that keeps me awake at night, Jonathan. Yeah, I would think that might cause a little statewide shortage. That is but a I, you know, I can understand a high risk a high risk teacher saying, hey, this is a little dangerous for me. I can understand that. Take okay, away sorry. Or take away I, I should let you respond. I just, sorry, go ahead. Particularly if it's a world language or, or a science teacher at the high school yeah. level. Right. We have right. hard enough time finding those people without a virus. Are you correct? So I have two questions. Um, piggybacking off the conversation that we had regarding live streaming and the technology and webcams, are, are we considering the security piece to that, Dr. Freeman? The idea that somebody can hack in to our cameras and hack into our classrooms? Yes, uh, we're both talking about security as well as privacy concerns, both for the students and the teachers who engage in it. And so again, uh, technology is changing communication and norms and etiquettes around what we do. So yes, uh, early on in this, uh, early on in this pandemic, Zoom was not considered a secure platform, yeah. right? We were hearing stories about people breaking into Zoom meetings all the time. Um, so it's, it's better now, but yes, it's something that we're keeping an eye on. Uh, I can't give you specifics. I'd need to rely on Mr. Mitchell to help with the specifics, uh, but we're confident with both the Zoom and the Google platforms. Uh, there's also an additional platform at the younger grades called Seesaw that we are comfortable with, and those are the only ones that we have approved uh, at the district level for teachers to use uh, to engage with their students at home. Uh, we will be revising our acceptable use policies and protocols and we'll be communicating with parents about the expectations for when a, a classroom comes into your home. Um, you're not recording the teachers, you're not taking photographs, that you're not interrupting the class. We, there's, there's a lot that we're concerned about. Um, statewide, we've received a number of legal opinions from Shipman and Goodwin on the use of video. Uh, there are some different uh, restrictions around using it when students are receiving uh, specialized supports that come out of their IEP compared to generalized instruction. But yes, privacy concerns and security concerns are things that are front of mind for us as we start to use these tools more frequently. And my second question went, was regarding transportation. Um, we had originally you know, we're working on how many, you know, having kids on school buses and then having to have um, monitors on the school buses. Did you get any sense from your survey um, about how parents were feeling about the, the bus issue? And are, is your sense that parents are going to be dropping their children off, those that have opted to sending their kids? Yes. So I've spent my whole career encouraging parents to put their kids on the bus and not drive your child to school. And now I'm doing the exact opposite. opposite. Now we are asking parents to please drive their children to school. Um, you know, and what that does is that will reduce density on the school bus. Therefore, the students who need to ride the bus will have more space and will be able to distance more effectively. We are requiring masks on the bus. Um, so it will be a benefit to everybody. Every single parent who can drive their child to school helps keep their child safer because their child is now excused, uh, exposed to the classroom cohort, but not to the bus cohort. But it also benefits everybody else because by having fewer kids mingling on the bus, you're having less transmission that can occur on the bus. We are concerned about, um, about congestion issues at all seven of our schools, but particularly at the high school and at Adams. 
We have met once um, with uh, Chief Hyatt. We're meeting again later this week with Chief Hyatt to talk about some of those concerns. Um, it will be less extreme for those first five weeks because right in the first five weeks of school, right, I'm actually concerned that we're gonna be running buses that have two or three students on them. In the first five weeks of school, we're encouraging all parents not to put their children on the bus, and then we're only bringing half of the kids to school on any given day. And our buses were already at less than capacity simply because the geography and the length of our runs. I'm actually worried that, I mean, right now, the, the, the ecologist in me is terribly concerned about the fuel we'll be burning to move three or four students on a full-sized school bus, but it will be safer. Um, on October 19th, when we then begin fully loading the buildings, I'm really concerned about the congestion. So we're be, we are putting notifications out to the community. We had a great suggestion at the meeting earlier today that we're going to ask the, the police department if we can put the um, electronic sign out in front of Adams and, let, and begin warning people to um, anticipate school delays starting on September 10th, because with the access to the on-ramps right there, I'm really concerned about, yeah. about the congestion. We were working on a um, we were working on a parking lot project at Adams to help separate the bus lot from the parental drop off. We needed Eversource to do some energy work underneath that lot, and now the storm has pushed us back. We've lost at least two weeks because Eversource, Eversource is not concerned about our parking lot project. They were concerned about getting their customers back on for the last two weeks. So we've lost two weeks of time there that could have helped to alleviate some of that. At the high school, um, right now at the high school, both parental drop-off and bus drop-off end up at the same doorway. We'll be separating those uh, for two reasons. One is that we won't be having all of the kids come through the same door. So the, the students who take the bus will enter the north door as they have always done. The students who come by parent will be moving away from the north door and having them enter through either the west or the south entrance. One, that just separates density. So we don't have a crowd of students all coming in the front door. But two, by choosing a door that is deeper onto our property, the cars at the high school that are dropping off will be able to queue up more of them on our property and get them off New England Road. So it will help to alleviate some of the traffic concerns there, not for the actual parents dropping off, they'll just be in traffic on our property, but for folks trying to use New England Road. Uh, we have no such opportunity at Adams. Right? 77 is, is just going to be a problem right now. So we'll be getting notifications out. We will be asking folks to be um, patient and we'll be trying to let the general pop. It's only going to be for half an hour, but it's going to be half an hour every morning at a pinch point and every afternoon at a, you know, at three o'clock or two thirty when the schools dismiss. Um, and it's just one of those compromises we're making to try to have kids exposed to each other a little less. I have another question about the transportation and the monitors. And I'm just curious if some innovation might be less expensive than monitors where you create something that just blocks the seats so that you really can only sit in a spaced out kind of formation when you get on the bus. Just curious if maybe something like that might work better than monitors. It's an interesting idea, Jonathan, but it's more than just where they sit. We also want to make sure that students are wearing their masks and keeping their masks on. We want to make sure that they're not uh, moving on the bus to sit next to each other and to squeeze into to a seat that is open. Um, and there's also loading and unloading protocols that we want to put into place. For any of you who rode a school bus, we're changing the whole tradition of school buses. Normally, whatever grade level, the oldest students always sit in the back of the bus. So at a high school run, the freshmen sit in the front and the seniors and juniors sit in the back. We're trying to change 50 years of bus tradition. And what we're saying is that the bus loads from the back forward. So the first child on goes all the way to the back of the bus, regardless of what grade you're in. And when you get to the school, we unload from the front to the back. So students aren't passing each other or queuing up in the aisle. And that's just going to require someone to remind, well, first to teach and then remind and then enforce those expectations. Um, changing those traditions is not gonna be easy. Robots might be able to do it though. Before we, before we ask any more questions, <clears throat> I wanna be respectful of everyone's time. Um, most importantly, I think to our members of the Board of Education who 
I don't know, you guys are just like in constant meetings and um, I want to kind of broach into the subject of um, where do we go from here? Um, do we have intermittent meetings or do we think that the monthly meetings are enough? Um, I think uh, in speaking actually with Mr. Gammerman earlier uh, this week, um, actually over the weekend, we were, you know, we always kibitz a little bit before these, these meetings. Uh, one of the questions that came up and it was a really good question is, or, or issues is that we're always, and it's just the way it goes, uh, we're always way behind on the meeting minutes and the information that we get. Um, you know, obviously we could read the paper uh, and we can get our sources and we can attend meetings, but the information that's in our packets, um, just because of timing, which we know things have to get approved and there's a timing issue, um, we're a little bit delayed on the information. So to get the most current information, to get the most current numbers and financial outlooks, um, I knew, I, I can't speak for the rest of my colleagues, but I knew you wouldn't have any numbers tonight. Um, to be able to pin on the, you know, what, the, what the additional expenses are. But over time, those will develop. Is there, um, you know, Katie, you reached out to me um, asking you know, about the possibility you know, of our offer to jointly meet. Um, this, is, this is evidently a much longer meeting um, than typically it would be because we wanted to entertain your comments and your thoughts and the process of what's been going on. But if we have a joint meeting, we can solely focus on this and maybe take it away from our regular meeting. Um, there's some pros and cons to this. I think the biggest con is it's another meeting. I don't think any of us really would mind meeting in, in a, you know, on, a, on a regular occurrence in regular days when it was, you know, back in the day, six months ago, we wouldn't mind, right? You guys are all meeting on a weekly, if not more basis. Um, so I'm very cautious of adding another meeting to your list. And I know our first selectman would feel exactly the same way. He mentioned that at the last meeting that, you know, it's just, you know, do we want to just have another meeting to talk about COVID related expenses or do we continue down the path of regular meetings and having, you know, under old business or having an agenda item and saying, you know, you know, talk about COVID uh, uh, process. And, and I really leave that up to you. You are the ones that are living this, that are breathing it, that are planning it that are having sleepless nights, Dr. Freeman and Dr. Balistrace, I'm sure actually all of you are probably having it. Linda trying to, try to balance books and trying to figure this all out um, and the entire Board of Ed. So I leave that up to you. I, I don't know about the rest of the Board of Finance, but I would certainly feel if you felt it was necessary, then I would be totally on board with having a special meeting every other, you know, in between, but I don't want to do anything that's going to add to your, your load right now. Can I also throw a, another suggestion into, into this is that we yeah. choose one or two Board of Finance members to attend Board of Education uh, um, meetings and report back, if that's helpful. I mean, we certainly don't want to infringe upon our Board of Ed colleagues, given the magnitude of what they're up against. Whatever yeah. is easiest is what I'm trying to propose. Um. So if I may, I mean, um, uh, I, I think when we have um, some, some firm numbers, you know, um, probably it will be good to, to try to have a, a dedicated time to, to, to talk through those. Um, I am happy. Uh, so obviously we have um, at every board of finance meeting, um, uh, Linda uh, wonderfully shows up every time, and then we have a, a Board of Ed member um, who also comes. I, I am happy to uh, to make a commitment uh, as the chair to, to, join, to join the Board of Finance meetings moving forward, um, you know, to provide additional updates. I, I think for, for me and, and for us, it's just re a couple of things are really important. We want to be very transparent with you and with the community about what we're up against in terms of um, potential expenditures here. You heard Dr. Freeman go through this list. These are not small. Um, we are not yet able to put a number on them, but I, uh, my request to you, um, Mr. Ailes, was, was to, to at least alert the Board of Finance to, to, to what we're starting to look at 
so that um, all of you were filled in as we learn it. Um, I think uh, as, as we move forward and we get a sense of the, the degree to which um, we will get reimbursed for some of these expenses, and I don't pretend to know how soon we'll know that, there may come a time when we have to make some decisions about whether our present budget um, uh, can sustain this or whether we are going to need the town to help support us with additional funding, either because the expenses have gotten significantly large and um, you know, refund, uh, federal or, or state refunding is, is not coming through in a way that we can support. Um, so, you know, I, I think I've, there's some good ideas here. If, if a couple of uh, Board of Finance members want to join us for um, a meeting, our meeting every month, we welcome them. Um, uh, I am also, as I said, um, in addition to our regular board member presenting uh, financial information with Linda every month, I am more than willing to join your Board of Finance meetings for the near future. This is important stuff, and I think it's just really important for us that um, that the that the communication continues. Great. Um, I, I I don't think there's anything wrong with maybe doing a little bit of both. Mm -hmm. um, you know, um, maybe that's something that the Board of Finance members can talk about. Um, you know, or maybe, you know, we, we get the messages, uh, we get all the Board of Education meeting um, notifications, the agendas, we get all of those as, um, you know, as a heads up. Um, maybe that's something we could share and, um, you know, or, or I could ask the Board of Finance, you know, we could volunteer, you know, maybe to, wh whoever can, actually, whoever can join. Uh, there's a couple, I, I know there's a few meetings that some of us have already attended. Um, so, you know, I think we'll make an effort to do whatever we can to be a part of that um, based on the notifications we get. And uh, Dr. Val Tracy, I would certainly uh, welcome uh, your presence at these meetings in the future, um, whether it's during the Board of Education report or we could even just call it old business and go over COVID related expenses. Dr. Freeman, you're more than obviously, you're always welcome, but, um, or, or you, you both of you can, you know, go back and forth and, you know, take one month and another month. Again, I don't want to. I don't think any of us want to bur overburden you, but we do want to be transparent with you. Um, I couldn't agree more with that, and um, it's just going to be helpful as we approach October, November, December, and we're starting to talk about the 21-22 budget. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were before we know it, we're going to be going into budget talks again. So um, it'll be a much different year of doing that. Um, so I think for the September meeting, why don't the Board of Finance, you know, let, let's see what we can do in terms of attending your meetings and having a better understanding, um, me included. Uh, anybody who can, rather than sit here and pick who can do it, let's just, we'll try to make that commitment as much as we can. And, and uh, Katie, if you can attend the September meeting and give us an update after school opens uh, formally, um, then we can have an update then. And, and again, maybe there are some numbers that will start to pan out. Mm -hmm. um, that you'll you'll know and maybe not, but at least we're keeping the lines of communication open. The board Ted, did I'm just sorry, agree. Ted, you wanted to say something, Mr. Ailes? Yes, go ahead. I think uh, in terms of uh, the members of board of finance uh, coming to our board of ed meetings, the most helpful part part for you to attend would be the operations and finance committee meeting which is at six o'clock before the 7.30 uh, monthly meeting. And that's where we really get into the numbers. Okay. At the, uh, at the actual board meetings themselves, the, the, uh, we, we don't go into the, okay. into the detail. That's a very good point. I, I appreciate that. Um, yes, I, I think that's, that's where we can, uh, we can try to, insert ourselves into the uh, into the listening mode um, and and again like I said we have the notifications so um, once we get that I can I can even send a message out to the board I'll copy and Tracy for FOI purposes whatever to say did you know just a reminder that the operations committee of the Board of Education is going to be meeting at six o'clock see if, you know whoever can join join and at least we'll be privy a week before our meeting so that we can at least hear that so that's very helpful thank you 
That's a good um, idea. Excuse me, um, um, Paul, will we, will we need to provide, will we need to know ahead of time so we can provide directed invitations? Um, Yes. So, well, there's a couple of ways. All of our meetings, while we've been using Zoom, oh, that's we, right. That's we right. have been live streaming the YouTube. So, any uh -huh. one, any one of you would certainly be able to watch. I think it would be beneficial to have you at the table. And that's, so, yes, yes, that's my point. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I if agree. you could, if you could let yeah. us know, or we could simply ask Mr. Mitchell to begin adding the entire board of finance to the invite for every operations meeting, please know that that means we're not expecting all of you to be at every operations meeting, but it would be an open invitation and you'd always have the reminder through the invite. You'd be able to click on and join us for as long as we remain in this Zoom format. We are beginning to yeah. discuss returning to public meetings. We're all uh, in-person public meetings. We're also beginning to discuss the ability to try to have both to both be in public and allow some members to continue to attend through Zoom. So we'll let you know if we make any changes or when we make any changes to that format. You I believe on September up. 9th, the executive order expires. Yes. And so yes. we, we all have to pay attention to that September 9th date around public meetings where votes are taken. Although what's interesting is I, I just learned that the, um, the mask um, requirement was extended six months from Friday. Um, I don't know if anybody anybody saw that, but the mask requirement was supposed to be, uh, I guess September 9th is when the the governor's orders expire. Right. But the latest, whatever, I don't know what they're on, triple Z now or something, triple M on, on executive orders. Uh, with the mask requirement, it says six months of the issuance on August 14th, the masks are required. So it's a bit of a debate Although it's not really, if it says six months, the mask requirement, it, it, that executive order goes six months. It doesn't expire September 9th. So there's all these little things and nuances that are coming up. Right. So, okay, so there's an there's a expiration to that, but th this particular order said, no, it's a six months from a date. So um, the only thing I wanna be careful of, um, <laughs> I looked up real quick, quick and I almost said Tracy, um, Karen, um, I, I might need to look into just uh, the formality of that because if we get invited, all seven of us, and we all attend, if you get oh, a quorum, a meeting. Like, right. you're, you're a quorum. Meeting that yeah, to be you'll close. have to so, be careful that you never have a quorum. You will have to sort of coordinate your attendance so that you yeah. don't break a quorum. So, right. so I think I think we can do that by email, and it won't constitute a quorum. It'll just be who can attend and who can't. There right. won't be any business. So I think that will just be a coordination issue on my end. So when we get that, I could just ask, okay, who can make it? And once I get, you know, three, then we'll, we'll stop it there. And anybody else again is of course, welcome to watch on YouTube. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. All right. Um, geez, I, I, I honestly, I can't thank you all enough for spending more time um, with us and get, bringing us up to date. Katie, I think this is exactly what we, you know, your, yes. your email to me was to give us an update. And I think it, tonight really gave us what we needed. So um, at least to hold us off for, for a few days. Well, and, 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 I, and I really appreciate um, uh, all of you on the Board of Finance. Uh, I, you know, this is a, this is a challenging time, um, obviously. Um, and, uh, it, and again, you know, our thought was that the sooner we can coordinate with all of you, communicate together, um, the better we're all going to be able to, to kind of uh, to do this uh, kind of in a financially responsible way. Yep, I agree. Could I ask one other quick question? Hopefully, quick. Hopefully, quick question. Sure. Has there been? I know the uh, fiscal year is still kind of just gotten started, but has there been any feedback from the state with regard to not so much reimbursement for our COVID-related costs, but the impact on the cost-sharing grants and the other kind of "quote unquote" normal? <laughs> reimbursements that we get from them have those has there been any indication as to how those are going to be impacted for the rest of the fiscal year is there going to be any change in what's what we might receive from the state not to my knowledge but uh, i'll i'll see if our financial gurus on the line know differently and i'm seeing lots of shaking heads no, the, the only thing we know is you know the governor does have the the right to make a five percent reduction um in at any time uh, in for our state reimbursement, um, but you know this is the 
second year of the biennial budget, we do anticipate receiving uh, our, our money this year. And again, I will, I will say that the following year, um, because there'll be new budgets coming forward, uh, that we anticipate having more of a problem. But to, at this point, uh, we have not heard anything to the contrary for this year. Like everything else, though, that may be subject to change. Absolutely, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you again. Um, is there anything under old, anything else under old business? How about new business under item nine? Public forum? I don't see anybody else that hasn't been actively engaged in this call, so. Um, all right, with that, thank you very much. Um, good luck with everything, Board of Education, with uh, the opening of schools. We'll be thinking of you. Uh, thank you very much. And um, Board of Finance, thank you. Um, with that, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. Move we adjourn. Well, your second. Uh, I can. Yeah, I'll second that, but I do also want to say hats off to Dr. Bellis Tracy and Dr. Freeman and the entire Board of Education. A lot, lot ahead of you this year. Agreed. Thank you. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Good Thank night, you, everyone. everyone. Have a wonderful evening. Good night, everybody. Thanks. Good night.